This is session five, chapters 11 through 13. Chapter 11. These were the things to do. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all of his will to keep from eating another one as he moved them. But he got it done, and when they were out of sight again, it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh, that, cleaning up the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hang it in the sun to dry, the berry juice that had soaked in, and smoothed the sand where he slept. But it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet. And when he was busy and had something to do, the depression seemed to leave. So there were things to do. With the camp squared away, he brought in more wood. He had decided to always have enough on hand for three days. And after spending one night with the fire for a friend, he knew what a staggering amount of wood that would take. He worked all through the morning at, the, at wood, breaking down dead limbs and breaking or chopping them in smaller pieces, storing them neatly beneath the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and in his reflection, he saw that the swelling on his head was nearly gone. There was no pain there, so he assumed that it had taken care of itself. His leg was also back to normal, although he had a small pattern of holes, roughly star-shaped, where the quills had nailed him. And while he was standing at the lake shore taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he'd been slightly heavy with a little extra weight just above his belt at the sides. This was completely gone, and his stomach had caved into the hunger, and the sun had cooked him past burning so that he was tanning, and with the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. But perhaps more than this, his was body was the change in his mind, or in the way he was, was becoming. I'm not the same, he thought. I see and I hear differently. He did not know when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but would know the sound. He would swing and look at it, a breaking twig, a movement of air, and know the sound as if somehow, somehow could move his mind back down the wave of sound to the source. He could know what the sound was before he quite realized he heard it. And when he saw something, a bird moving, a wing inside a bush or a ripple on the water, he would truly see the thing, not just notice it as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all parts of it, see the whole thing, the feathers, see the color of the feathers, see the bush, the size and shape and the color of its leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water and see the wind ma made the ripples and which way the wind had to blow to make the ripples move in a certain way. None of that used to be in Brian, and now it was a part of him, a changed part of him, a grown part of him, and the two things, his mind and his body, had come together as well and made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. When his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight, his mind took control of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it, to deal with it. These were these things to do. When the wood was done, he decided to get a signal fire ready. He moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff over his shelter and was pleased to find a large, flat stone area. More wood, he thought, moaning inwardly. He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs, carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, he thought of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He'd never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready, and if he heard an engine or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff with wood he, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake and rested. The lake lay before him, 20 or so feet below, and he had not seen it this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, she had a moment of fear, a breath-tightening little rip of terror, but it passed and he was quickly caught up in the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal.
From his height, he could see not just the lake, but across part of the forest, a green carpet, and it was full of life. Birds, insects, there was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown, bent and gnarled. Sitting on one limb was a bluebird with a crest and a sharp beak, a kingfisher, he thought of a picture he had seen once, which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split part of a second later, and in its mouth was a small fish, wiggling silver in the sun. It took the fish to a limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. Fish, of course, he thought. There were fish in the lake, and they were food. And if a bird could do it, he scrambled down the side of the bluff and trotted to the edge of the lake, looking down into the water. Somehow it never occurred to him to look inside the water, only at the surface. The sun was flashing back up into his eyes, and he moved off to the side and took his shoes off and waded out 15 feet. Then he turned and stood still with the sun at his back and studied the water again. It was, he saw after a moment, literally packed with life. Small fish swam everywhere, some narrow and long, some round, most of them three or four inches long, some a bit larger, and many smaller. There was a patch of mud off to the side leading to deeper water, and he could see old clam shells there, so there must be clams. As he watched, a crayfish, looking like a tiny lobster, left one of the empty clam shells and went to another looking for something to eat digging with its claws. While he stood, some of the small roundish fish came quite close to his legs and he tensed, got ready and made a wild stab at grabbing one of them. They exploded away in a hundred flicks of quick light, so fast that he had no hope of catching them that way. But they soon came back, seemed to be curious about him and as he walked from the water, he tried to think of a way to use that curiosity to catch them. He had no hooks or string, but if he could somehow lure them into the shallows and make a spear, a small fish spear, he might be able to strike fast enough to get one. He would have to find the right kind of wood, slim and straight. He had seen some willows up along the lake that might work, and he could use the hatchet to sharpen it and shape it while he was sitting by the fire tonight. And that brought up the fire, which he had to feed again. He looked at the sun and saw it was getting late in the afternoon, and when he thought of how late it was, he thought that he ought to reward all of his work with another egg, and that made him think that some kind of dessert would be nice. He smiled when he thought of dessert, so fancy, and he wondered if he should move up the lake and see if he could find some raspberries after he banked the fire and while he was looking for the right wood for a spear. Spear wood, he thought, and it all rolled together just rolled together and rolled over him. There were these things to do. Chapter 12. The fish spear didn't work. He stood in the shallows and waited again and again. The small fish came closer and closer and he lunged time after time, but was always too slow. He tried throwing it, jabbing it, everything but flailing with it, and it didn't work. The fish were just too fast. He had been so sure, so absolutely certain that it would take, that it would work the night before. Sitting by the fire, he had taken the willow and carefully peeled the bark until he had a straight staff, about six feet long and just under an inch thick at the base, the thickest end. Then propping the hatchet in a crack in the rock wall, he pulled the head of his spear against it, carving a thin piece off each time until the thick end tapered down to a needle point. Still not satisfied, he could not imagine hitting one of the fish with a single point. He carefully used the hatchet to split the point up the middle for eight or ten inches and jammed a piece of wood into the split to make a two-pronged spear with the points about two inches apart. It was crude, but it looked effective and seemed to have a good balance when he stood outside the shelter and hefted the spear. He had worked on this fish spear until it had become more than just a tool. He'd spent hours and hours on it, and now it didn't work. He moved into the shallows and stood, and the fish came to him. Just as before, they swarmed around his legs, some of them almost six inches long. 
but no matter how he tried, they were too fast. At first he tried throwing it, but that had no chance. As soon as he brought his arm back, well before he threw, the movement frightened them. Next he tried lunging at them, having the spear ready just above the water and thrusting with it. Finally, he actually put the spear in the water and waited until the fish were right in front of it. But still somehow he telegraphed his motion before he thrust and they saw it and flashed away. He needed something to spring the spear forward, some way to make it move faster than the fish, some motive force, a string that snapped, or a bow, a bow and arrow, a thin long arrow with the point in the water and the bow pulled back, so all he had to do was release the arrow. Yeah, that was it. He had to invent the bow and arrow. He almost laughed as he moved out of the water and put his shoes on. The morning sun was getting hot and he took his shirt off. Maybe that's how it really happened way back when the primitive man tried to spear fish and it didn't work and they invented the bow and arrow. Maybe it was always that way. Discoveries happened because they needed to happen. He had not eaten anything yet this morning, so he took a moment to dig up the eggs and eat one. Then he reburied them, banked the fire with a couple of thicker pieces of wood, settled the hatchet on his belt and took the spear in his right hand and set off up the lake to find wood to make a bow. He went without a shirt, but something about the wood smoke smell on him kept the insects from bothering him as he walked to the berry patch. The raspberries were starting to become overripe just in two days, and he would have to pick as many as possible after he found the wood, but he did take a little time now to pick a few and eat them. They were full and sweet, and when he picked one, two others would fall off the limbs into the grass, and soon his hands and cheeks were covered with red berry juice, and he was full. That surprised him, being full. He hadn't thought he would ever be full again, knew only hunger, and here he was full. One turtle egg and a few handfuls of berries, and he felt full. He looked down at his stomach and saw that it was still caved in. It did not bulge out as it would have with two hamburgers and a freezy slush. It must have shrunk. And there was still hunger, but not like it was, not tearing at it. This hunger was hunger that he knew would be there always, even when he had food. A hunger that made him look for things to see things, a hunger to make him hunt. He swung his eyes across the berries to make sure the bear wasn't there at his back, and then he moved down to the lake. The spear went out before him automatically, moving the brush away from his face as he walked, and when he came to the water's edge, he swung left. Not sure what he was looking for and not knowing what wood might be best for a bow, he had never made a bow, never shot a bow in his life but it seemed that it would be along the lake near the water. He saw some young birch and there were springy, but they lacked snap somehow, as did the willows. Not enough whip back. Halfway up the lake, just as he started to step over a log, he was absolutely terrified by an explosion under his feet. Something like a feathered bomb blew up and away in a flurry of leaves and thunder. It frightened him so badly that he fell back and down and then it was gone, leaving only an image in his mind. A bird, it had been about the size of a small chicken, only with a fan tail and stubby wings that slammed against its body and made a loud noise. Noise there and gone. He got up and brushed himself off. The bird had been speckled, brown and gray, but it must not be a very smart because Brian's foot had nearly had been nearly on it before it flew. Half a second more and he would have stepped on it <clears throat> and caught it, he thought, and eaten it. He might be able to catch one or spear one. Maybe, he thought, maybe it tasted like chicken. Maybe he could catch one or spear one and probably did taste just like chicken. Just like chicken when his mother baked it in the oven with garlic and salt and it turned golden brown and crackled. He shook his head to drive the picture out and moved down to the shore. There was a tree there with long branches that seemed straight, and when he pulled on one of them and let go, it had almost a vicious snap to it. He picked one of the limbs that seemed right and began chopping where the limb joined the tree. The wood was hard and he didn't want to cause it to split, so he took his time, took small chips, and concentrated so hard that at first he didn't hear it. A persistent whine. 
like insects, only more steady, with an edge of a roar to it, was in his ears, and he chopped and cut and was thinking of a bow, how he could make a bow, how it would be when he shaped it with the hatchet, and still the sound did not cut through until the limb was nearly off the tree and the whine was inside his head, and he knew it then. A plane. It was a motor, far off, but seeming to get louder. They were coming for him. He threw down the limb and his spear, and holding the hatchet, he started to run for camp. He had to get fire up on the bluff and signal to them to get fire and smoke up. He put all of his life into his legs, jumped logs, and moved through brush like a light ghost, swiveling and running, his lungs filling and blowing, and now the sound was louder, coming in his direction. If not right at him, at least closer. He could see it all in his mind now, a picture the way it would be. He would get the fire going, and the plane would see the smoke and circle, circle once, then again, and waggle its wings. It would be a float plane, and it would land on the water and come across the lake, and the pilot would be amazed that he was alive after all of these days. All this he saw as he ran for the camp and the fire. They would take him from here and this night, this very night he would sit with his father and eat and tell them all the things. He could see it now. Oh yes, as he ran in the sun, his legs liquid springs. He got to the camp, still hearing the whine of the engine and one stick of wood still had good flame. He dove inside and grabbed the wood and ran around the edge of the ridge, climbed up like a cat and blew nearly and had the flame feeding growing when the sound moved away. It was abrupt, as if the plane had turned. He shielded the sun from his eyes and tried to see it and tried to make the plane become real in his eyes. But the trees were so high, so thick, and now the sound was still fainter. He kneeled again to the flames and blew and added grass and chips and the flames fed and grew and in a moment he had a bonfire as high as his head. But the sound was gone now. Look back, he thought, look back, see the smoke, turn now, turn, please turn. Look back, he whispered, feeling all the pictures fade, seeing his father's face fade like the sound, like lost dreams, like an end to hope. Turn now, come back, look back, see the smoke, turn for me. But it kept moving away until he could not hear it, even in his imagination, in his soul, gone. He stood on the bluff over the lake, his face cooking in the roaring bonfire, watching the clouds of ash and smoke going into the sky, and thought, no more than thought, he knew then that he would never get out of this place. Not now. Not ever. That had been a search plane, he was sure of it. That might have been them and they had come as far off to the side of the flight plan as they thought that he would have to come and then turn back. They did not see his smoke. They did not hear the cry from his mind. They would not return. He would never leave now, never get out of here. He went down to his knees and felt the tears start, cutting through the smoke and ash on his face silently falling onto the stone. Gone, he thought finally, it was all gone. All silly and gone, no bows, no spears or fish or berries. It was all silly anyway, just a game. He could do a day, but not forever. He could not make it if they did not come back for him someday. He could not play this game without hope. He could not play the game without a dream. They had taken it all away from him now, they had turned away from him and there was nothing for him now. The plane was gone, his family gone, all of it gone. They would not come. He was alone and there was nothing for him. Chapter 13. Brian stood at the end of the long part of the L of the lake and watched the water. He smelled the water, listened to the water, was the water. A fish moved and his eyes jerked sideways to see the ripples, but he did not move any other part of his body, and he did not raise the bow or reach into his belt pouch for a fish arrow. It was not the right kind of fish, not a food fish. The food fish stayed close in in the shallows and did not roll that way, but made quicker movements, food movements. The large fish rolled and stayed deep and could not be taken, but it didn't matter. This day, this morning, he was not looking for fish. Fish was the light meat, and he was sick of them. 
He was looking for one of the foolish birds. He called them fool birds, and there was a flock that lived near the end of the long part of the lake. But something he did not understand had stopped him, and he stood, breathing gently through his mouth, to keep silent, letting his eyes and ears go out and do the work for him. It happened before this way. Something had come into him from outside to warn him, and he had stopped. Once it had been a, the bear again. He had been taking the last of the raspberries, and something came inside and stopped him, and when he looked where his ears said to look, there was a female bear with cubs. Had he taken two more steps, he would have come between the mother and her cubs, and that was a bad place to be. As it was, the mother had stood and faced him and made a sound, a low sound in her throat, to threaten and warn him. He paid attention to that feeling now, and he stood and waited patiently, knowing that he was right and that something would come. Turn, smell, listen, feel, and then a sound, a small sound. And he looked up and away from the lake and saw the wolf. It was halfway up the hill from the lake, standing with its head and shoulders sticking out into a small opening, looking down on him with wide yellow eyes. He'd never seen the wolf, and the size threw him, not as big as a bear, but somehow seeming that large. The wolf claimed all that was below him as his own and took Brian as his own. Brian looked again and looked back and for a moment felt afraid because the wolf was so right. He knew Brian, knew him and owned him and chose not to do anything to him. But the fear moved then and moved away and Brian knew the wolf for what it was. Another part of the woods, another part of all of it. Brian relaxed the tension on the spear in his hand, settled the bow in his other hand from where it had started to come up. He knew the wolf now as the wolf knew him. He nodded to it, nodded and smiled. The wolf watched him for another time, another part of his life, and then it turned and walked effortlessly up the hill, and as it came out of the brush, it was followed by three other wolves, all equally large and gray and beautiful, all looking down on him as they trotted past and away, and Brian nodded to each of them. He was not the same now. The Brian that stood and watched the wolves move away and nodded to them was completely changed. Time had come, time that he measured, but he didn't care about. Time had come into his life and moved out and left him different. In measured time, 47 days had passed since the crash. 42 days, he thought, since he had died and been born as the new Brian. When the plane had come and gone, it had put him down and gutted him and dropped him and left him with nothing. The rest of that first day, he'd gone down and down until dark. He had let the fire go out, had forgotten to even eat an egg, and let his brain take him down to where he was done, where he just wanted to be done and done, to where he wanted to die. He had settled into this gray funk deeper and still deeper until finally, in the dark, he'd gone up to the ridge and taken the hatchet and tried to end it by cutting himself. Madness, a hissing madness that took his brain. There'd been nothing for him, and he tried to become nothing, but the cutting had been hard to do, impossible to do, and he'd at last fallen to his side, wishing for death, wishing for an end, and slept, only he didn't sleep. When his eyes closed and his mind opened, he lay on the rock through the night, lay and hated it, and wished for it to end, and thought the word, cloud down, cloud down, through the awful night. Over and over, the word wanting all the clouds to come down, but in the morning, he was still there. Still there on his side, and the sun came up, and when he opened his eyes, he saw the cuts on his arm, the dry blood turning black. He saw the blood and hated the blood, hated what he had done to himself when he was the old Brian and was weak. And two things came into his mind, two true things. He was not the same. The plain passing changed him. The disappointment cut him down and made him new. He was not the same and would never be again like he had been. There was one of the true things, the new things, and the other was that he would not die. He would not let death in again. He was new. Of course, he made a lot of mistakes. He smiled now walking up the lake shore after the wolves were gone, thinking of the early mistakes. 
the mistakes that came before he realized that he had to find new ways to be what he had become. He made a new fire, which he now kept going using partially rotten wood because the punky wood would smolder for many hours and still come back with fire. But that had been the extent of doing things right for a while. His first bow was a disaster and it almost blinded him. He sat a whole night and shaped the limbs carefully until the bow looked beautiful. He spent two days making arrows. The shafts were willow, straight and with the bark peeled and fire hardened the points and split a couple of them to make fork points as he had done with the spear. He had no feathers, so he just left them bare, figuring for a fish that there only had to travel a few inches. He had no string and that threw him until he looked down at his tennis shoes. They had long laces, too long, and he found that one lace cut in half would take care of both shoes and the other lace for a bowstring. All seemed to be going well until he tried a test shot. He put an arrow to the string, pulled it back to his cheek, pointed at a dirt hummock, and at that precise instant, the bow wood exploded in his hand, sending splinters and chips of wood into his face. Two pieces actually stuck in his forehead just above his eyes, and they had been only, and had they been only slightly lower, they would have blinded him. Too stiff. Mistakes. In his mental journal, he listed them to tell his father. He listed all the mistakes. He made a new bow with slender limbs and more fluid, gentle pull, but he could not hit the fish, though he sat in the water and was, in the end, surrounded by a virtual, virtual cloud of small fish. It was infuriating. He could pull the bow back, set the arrow just above the water, and when the fish was no more than an inch away, release the arrow, only to miss. It seemed to him the arrow had gone right through the fish again and again, but the fish didn't get hurt. Finally, after hours, he struck the arrow down in the water, pulled the arrow, and waited for a fish to come close. And while he was waiting, he noticed that the water seemed to make the arrow bend or break in the middle. Of course, he had forgotten that water refracts or bends light. He'd learned that somewhere in some class. Maybe it was biology, he couldn't remember. But it did bend light, and that meant the fish were not where they appeared to be. They were lower, just below, which meant he had to aim under them. He would not forget his first hit, not ever. A round-shaped fish with golden sides, sides as gold as the sun, stopped in front of the arrow and he aimed just beneath it, at the bottom edge of the fish, and he released the arrow and there was a bright flurry, a splash of gold in the water. He grabbed the arrow and raised it up and the fish was on the end, wiggling against the blue sky. He held the fish against the sky until it stopped wiggling and held it and looked to the sky and felt his throat tighten and swell and fill with pride at what he had done. He had done food. With his bow, with an arrow fashioned by his own hands, he had done food. He had found a way to live. The bow had given him this way and he exulted in it, in the bow, in the arrow, in the fish, in the hatchet, in the sky. He stood and walked from the water still holding the fish and arrow and the bow against the sky, seeing them as they fit his arms, as they were part of him. He had food. He cut a green willow fork and held the fish over the fire until the skin crackled and peeled away and the meat inside was flaky, moist, and tender. This he picked off carefully with his fingers, tasting every piece, mashing them in his mouth with his tongue to get the juices out of them hot, steaming pieces of fish. He could not, he thought then, ever get enough. And all the first day, the first new day, he spent going to the lake, shooting a fish, taking it back to the fire, cooking it, eating it, and then back to the lake, shooting a fish, cooking it, and eating it. And on that way until it was dark. He had taken the scraps back to the water with the thought that that might work for bait. And the other fish came by the hundreds to clean them up. He could take his pick of them, like a store, he thought, just like a store, and he could not remember later how many he ate that day, but he thought it must have been over 20. It had been a feast day, his first feast day, and a celebration of being alive and the new way he had of getting food. By the end of the day, when it became dark and he lay next to the fire with his stomach full of fish and grease from the meat smeared around his mouth, he could feel new hope building in him. Not hope that he would be rescued, 
that was gone. But hope in his knowledge, hope in the fact that he could learn and survive and take care of himself. Tough hope, he thought that night. I am full of tough hope. <laughs>